Hi everyone, welcome. I'll just a moment while I get my guests on stage. Cool, this should be coming up now. Hi, Knight. Hi, Stacey. Hello, everyone. Cool, just getting Han on stage as well. Great. Um, I'll introduce myself in the meantime. My name's Stacey. I'm the Sales and Marketing Coordinator here at Relab. Um, on stage with me, I've got Knight Howe, CEO and co-founder of Relab. And we are just waiting for Han to come on the stage. I might have to restart. Okay, we'll give Han a moment, but um, in the meantime, um, we are going to be chatting about the design process in regards to subdivision developments. Um, and before we start everything, I'll, just a few notes for the audience. Um, please feel free to pop into the chat and let us know who you are, where you're from. Um, it's nice to know who we're talking to. And um, if you've got any questions throughout the webinar, just chuck them in the chat and we will get to them at the end. Um, we've also got Lou in the chat there. If you've got any issues or problems or have any questions about Relab, you can ask her. Um, and you will receive a recording of the webinar at the end um, in case you've got a pop off or, or anything. And we'll try to keep the chat to about 30 minutes with question time. So I'll just try to um, add Han on again. See if he's got it sorted. So there's a few names I have to go through here. Browser permission. Hey, Han, um, it's Knight here. If you're having a um, browser permission error, maybe try a different browser uh, if you do have one. Uh, or you might have to, if you're on a Mac, you have to go into systems and give your Safari or Chrome permission um, to do that. Give it a go. Um, I don't think mobile works as a host. Um, or as a guest speaker, you, you have to be on a desktop. Yeah, it doesn't doesn't let me add mobile users. Cool. Hey, while we're waiting for Han to get his system up and running, uh, maybe I'll just uh, uh, let everyone know what Relap and our team's uh, been up to uh, recently. Um, and, and for those who are watching this live, thank you very much for, um, um, yeah, for your time. I mean, I know we're a week away from Christmas, so thank you for your time. So yes, at um, Relap, the team has been working very, very hard on delivering new features uh, every month and every week. I think our latest features including um, customizable property summary report. So uh, a lot of our users, uh, they love downloading a summary report from Relab, which will have all the details, all the maps, um, and, and, and share that with your clients or their friends. Previously, you can only download uh, the whole set, it's all or nothing. But in our last release, which went live about two or three weeks ago, we have given our user the ability to select and only include the relevant sections that they want to include in those report. Not only that, uh, they can now also uh, enter their own uh, valuation or, or customizable valuation, which means if you're an agent, uh, if you don't like the valuation range that Relax presents, you can uh, put in what you think that the real market value uh, for the property valuation as well as rental valuation and download that report for your clients, which is very handy. And now we have Han uh, joining us. Oh, it took a while. OK, 
Okay, got it now. You guys can all hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Excellent, excellent. How are you guys going? Good, thank you. Good, okay. to, see you. good to see you tonight. You look good. Ah, <laughs> uh, oh, Serena says you're breaking up tonight. Will this webinar be available on recording? Yes, well, um, okay, we'll go um, straight into it. Um, so Han, um, thank you for joining us. Do you mind quickly introducing yourself and telling us a bit about your role at X Studio? No problem. Um, X Studio is a four-year-old company um, that specializes in uh, residential uh, projects. Um, we do architectural work for uh, subdivisions and we do um, architectural work for private developments. Did we just cut off here? Um, I can still hear you. Okay. Back live? Yeah. Technical stuff, eh? Um, I'm, I've been the uh, associate director for about three years now. Um, I've had seven years of background um, in architectural design um, since graduation. And uh, while in university, I worked part-time for a roofing company called Neuralite. Um, so altogether, probably 10 years um, of experience um, in the industry. Um, apart from architectural design, um, I also am a part-time developer. Um, so I help my parents um, and, and I have a project of my own that I, that I run um, for subdivision work. So for today, today's session, we're discussing the design process of um, subdivision developments from the perspective of an architect, which is why we've got Han on here. Um, the aim we're wanting to draw is to um, draw the lines between the key design objectives being desirability, feasibility, and viability. Um, so what we want to get out of this webinar is how an architect can design a project that ticks all of those boxes. Mm -hmm. And so I'll start off with desirability, um, which I guess is the human side of things. Um, Han, can you take us through a high level process of how you work with your clients to design a development and what other stakeholders are uh, involved in the process? No problem. So um, in terms of working with property developers, um, I think it, it comes down um, to um, when the property developer actually approaches the architect. So um, if we're just talking standard architectural service, um, we're talking uh, just doing the architectural side of the things. We may assist with the design of the house, the resource consenting process, the building consenting process, um, and that's pretty much our work done. Um, the other um, type of service that we do is what I call a full scope management. Um, and that sort of um, takes up probably 95% of our client base. Um, and so this is where the project and the entire subdivision is actually led by either the architect or the planner. Um, and what that means is that um, before the, ideally, before the client even signs off and purchases or um, fully um, uh, completes the purchase of a property, um, they'll actually talk to us. Um, we give a preliminary um, evaluation of the, the site. Um, indicate to them what um, problems that they, they have or might run into later down the track. We'll also let them know how many units they can build, um, how high they can build and what's their sort of max yield. From there, they sign with us. And then uh, once we're on board, um, then we engage uh, the relevant consultants um, that are required to complete the project for them. And so it, it takes a lot of the stress away from uh, developers who are, who are new um, who haven't done this, this sort of thing before, um, who don't know um, what they need um, and who to look for. And so um, that's the that's sort of uh, full scope management process that we, um, that we offer. And then we, we sort of manage it for them from the start all the way through to um, the issuing of the building consent. And then from there, we can either link them with um, some builders that we know, um, or if they, can, if they find their own builders, then we'll work with those builders until the project is complete, basically. And moving on to feasibility, which is the technical side of things, um, assessing the feasibility about the feasibility of the design and how the design will be turned into a building. Um, what are the top property features you need to take into consideration for the design? 
in order to realize a, a good subdivision. Um, so, we, so if we're talking about um, key aspects that we're actually looking for in a property, um, my top three, I would have it um, in no particular order, um, but um, services, um, I would look at flooding, and I would also look at uh, regulatory and um, the legal aspects of the, of the site. So I'll just briefly go through each one of those. Um, I did do a, a write-up regarding this, which I believe is in the blog um, for the Relab, on the Relab page. Um, services, I think, is, is one, of the, one of the key things, and um, a, a lot of um, developers are becoming more and more aware of services. So in order to facilitate a subdivision, um, each section needs a stormwater connection and a wastewater connection. Um, water is technically not a problem most in most cases. Um, but most sites, or a few sites, I would say a good 30% all across Auckland, um, don't have um, immediate access to either one or both of those um, service connections. And so if you don't have that connection available on site, then you're going to have to look for alternative methods um, to get rid of your stormwater and wastewater. And that can become very, very troublesome. Um, for example, if you if you don't have a connection on your site, but your neighbor has that connection, then you're going to immediately go through a uh, neighbor's sign-off um, process, um, which can take a very, very long time. Your neighbor can demand a lot of money from you, um, and a lot of our clients have run into that situation. We're talking upwards of hundreds of thousands of dollars um, just to allow connections um, to go through a neighbor's property. Um, and it, it just becomes a very, very, um, very, very troublesome aspect of the development if you don't have those in place. So number one, I would say services. Number two, uh, flooding, um, also very, very important. Um, flooding has to do with overland flow paths and flood plains. Um, if we're looking, now we're talking about sort of natural geology of the Auckland um, landscape and where natural rainwater sort of congregates um, in sloped areas, um, that can often trigger some aspect of the architectural design where the houses can't block the path of the flood, or if they're sitting within the floodplain itself, they have to be lifted up above the ground so that um, in, in the case of a major flood, the houses aren't um, soaking wet. Um, so that's number two. Um, and lastly, number three is regulatory. So that is in conjunction with the uh, unitary plan, um, what you're allowed to do legally under the um, unitary plan, how tall you're allowed to build, um, the density that you're allowed, how many units you're allowed to build, and, and also legal. Um, and that has to do with your entitlements on the, uh, uh, per, um, the site title. Um, and particularly the interests, um, a lot of sort of hidden limitations when we're talking about covenants um, and that sort of, those sort of aspects that can really limit a subdivision. So my top three, those would be there. Perfect. And I will just share my screen quickly. I've got a few examples of your work that I'll just flick through as um, we go through the next questions. Um, Cool. Can you see that? Okay. Yep. Perfect. Okay. So my next question, um, we see a lot of commentary regarding concern about subdivisions and the lack of aesthetic design and um, the pleasing aspect of it. Um, what does X Studio do to combat this? So uh, architectural design, I think, great design in general is a very, very touchy subject. Um, I would like to say, I mean, architectural design is, is similar to art, um, in, in, in which case it's subjective. And so, I mean, even though that we're proud of the work that we do, and a lot of the clients say that we do do some really, really cool projects and pretty buildings, um, one design is not going to please all. Um, and so you just have to, first you have to set that fact. Um, but in terms of subdivision um, and, and sort of managing the sort of aesthetic qualities um, of a design. I think the most important thing comes down to balancing um, the architectural language 
uh, with the project budget. Um, that balance is, is a very, very fine line. Um, because on one hand, you have developers who, you know, their, I mean, we're talking housing supply, but their main goal is always um, profitability, um, delivering a good product, but profitability has to be taken into account. Um, and so they don't want to spend too much money. Um, and if they do, um, and they can't sort of um, have the market meet um, the, the purchase rate that they need to sell it at, it doesn't make sense to them. Um, and balancing that with architectural language where the architect sort of wants to um, upspec everything and make everything um, high end materials, um, high finishes, um, it's, it's very, very hard. And so most of the time we talk very close with, closely with our, with our clients. Um, we get to know, you know, the, the sort of market that the certain project is within. So that one there, um, it's Milford. Um, very, very um, high end um, residential area. Um, this development was actually the last um, mixed housing urban zoning section along all of that um, area of Milford. And so that was the last section that would allow three story construction as of right now. Um, and everything beyond that between this section and the sea was going to be two story. And so the initial discussion that we had with the developer was hey, first off, we're doing three story to maximize the site, but we need to also maximize the views because we can guarantee the third story will see over all those units in front and we'll get a nice sea view in that development. Um, that paired with the fact that it is Milford, um, the client was willing to sort of adjust the budget um, to increase it more than the sort of standard spec. And so you see some elements coming into play where we're using um, lightweight concrete panels um, with the plaster finish, that's the white that you see. Um, we get to choose um, nicer bricks um, and we also get to introduce um, some louver screens that sort of add up to, um, architectural articulation. Um, that's sort of like a architect's dream in terms of working with a developer. Um, you're not always going to get that sort of situation and you're going to get um, some sections that just doesn't make sense. Um, and these units um, sold quite fast um, and I think only a couple left on the market. Um, at 3 million, um, but obviously um, if we're talking um, development for affordable housing, then we're looking at the sort of 800K to one, one mil price point for the final sale of those houses. And so if we're working on projects like those, then we're gonna strip it, strip all the back. Um, we're gonna use some sort of more standard building materials. Um, and then it's just a matter of, hey, even though we have a sort of um, more simpler um, design palette, how do we articulate maybe the roof slope or the windows stuff that really doesn't affect the budget too much but if you articulate it, articulate it in a nice way it's still going to make the architecture look good and appealing to stand out um, from the rest cool now the last section that i want to address is the viability um, which is how will the project be fi financially sustainable um, my question for you is, what are the biggest challenges you see with designing subdivision developments? Um, I reckon in today's, I mean, 2021, the biggest challenge would have to be, um, in my own words, I would say keeping up with the constant shifting dynamic of the sort of landscape of development. Um, and so what I mean by that is, architects and planners and sort of builders, they're thrusted in a sort of industry that's constantly evolving and constantly changing. Um, for example, in I think 2017, um, the unitary plan was actually fully came, came fully came into effect. Um, before that, we relied on the district plan. Um, and so um, the district plan had a limitation of 600 square meters uh, per section. Otherwise you weren't able to be, you weren't able to subdivide a, a property. Um, so with the unitary plan, um, everything um, changed in terms of um, controls and now you're able to sort of um, uh, maximize the site and design in, in a particular way um, as long as you can prove to council that um, the planning regulations are met, um, they'll allow for subdivision. Um, but some of you may have heard that the um, something called the MDRS is coming into effect next year, which is the, um, in fact, you guys did a seminar about it. Um, a, week, a month ago or so. Um, so there's a, there's a new one coming in, which is the medium density 
um, regula regulation in August next year. That's going to, again, continuously change the, the landscape of how we design houses. Um, it's going to increase the density. And so you're forever, as an architect, as a builder, as a planner, um, adjusting to these new controls, these new regulations to sort of upkeep um, and provide your client with the, the latest sort of information um, and um, sort of suit yourself, um, gear yourself up to sort of design for um, the, the ever shifting landscape. Um, other than the MDRs and the unitary plan, you do have um, things like council team leaders. Um, they're constantly coming and going. And so one council team leader's um, sort of assessment of a subdivision might not be the same as the, the next. And so we've had projects which, um, if, if you take one of my one, for example, um, a six loss subdivision in Pakaranga, um, that would um, have been uh, easily granted consent um, two years ago um, for, for six units. Um, but for if I were to re, um, re-lodge that consent today, because it's a different team leader, um, and the different um, assessment criteria, um, I may be looking at five units. So there's that portion, uh, there's a the unitary plan, um, water care, um, they're constantly changing their standards. Um, you also probably have heard of the Wallace um, Ave case um, that was on the New Zealand Herald, I think uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, that case alone um, put all of Auckland's um, resource consents on hold. Um, for subdivisions more than four units. So uh, if any developers are listening right now wondering why their resource consent isn't out, it's because of the Wallace um, Ave case. Um, things like this, um, it's it's just constantly um, shifting um, and we really need to stay ahead um, of these changes to pretty much give our client the best advice for them to bring out the value of their, their property. Yeah, that's every time I talk to someone new, there's like always different things that pop up that I wouldn't have thought about that come into play with um, the process of um, resource consents and everything. So that's right. really interesting. Um, you kind of touched on this before, but um, what's your thinking process behind achieving a beautiful design and making sure the budget is kept to plan? Um, it's, it's, uh... If I were to talk about architectural design, um, I can go on forever. Um, and um, I mean, design is such a sort of broad um, aspect to sort of talk about. Um, and uh, people go to go to uni for a very, very long time, five years to study this, this paper. And um, I think we still come out not having a real grasp of how to articulate a nice looking building. Um, for me, I can only speak about me personally, but um, for me, uh, the, the process would be um, first fitting in the uh, the number of units that the client wants on on, on a section, um, evaluating the the density of those number of units um, in accordance with the unitary plan conditions. So, if you want seven seventeen units, say in the in the image. Um, of Taha Roto Road um, there, that was about 20 something units. Um, then how are we going to get the car parking um, involved? Where's the car going to come in? Um, is the car going to go to the left, like you see in the final product? Or are we going to split um, those four units in half, two on one side, two on the other, and bring the car park um, in the middle? Um, that one example would change the dynamic of how those four buildings sort of end up on that streetscape immediately. Um, and so many, many factors come into play, um, not just budget. Um, it, it starts from the, the client brief, but then it sort of evolves. Um, there's many other factors coming in, the school being next door, sunlight angles, uh, maximum height, um, maneuvering, um, privacy, those louver screens that we installed just because um, those units, um, the residentials upstairs is facing Taha Roto Road, which is a main arterial road. Um, the glazing downstairs um, for the commercial um, areas of that development. Um, all those come into play. Um, also the uh, fire rating aspect of that project. Um, we actually wanted to use um, a lot of cedar um, and timber for that project, but if we're talking 
um, terraced houses and there's a fire um, fire rating regulation and so you can't actually use combustible materials for that um, those are just a few of the examples there's probably about 200 of them that sort of you have to uh, really really balance as you're coming through the design process and so yeah Cool, and I will get to the questions at the end, but if anyone has any questions, um, add them in the chat now. Um, those are my last questions for Han. Um, but in the meantime, I just want to ask um, Knight if he could take a few, take us through a few uh, Relab features um, that could help you in this process. Absolutely. Um, can, you, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you. Awesome, cool. Uh, I wasn't sure where the moment. Hey, um, that, that was awesome. Thank you very much, Han. Um, so, um, hey everyone. Um, actually, there's a bit of story in terms of um, a number of key features that we currently have on Relab. So last year, this last year this this time, or, or maybe a, a bit earlier, before we actually launched a number of key. Um, product on Relab, namely the subdivision calculator, um, actually XStudio and um, a good friend Owen um, from XStudio had a lot to do in terms of helping us shape um, a number of our product features. So um, thanks goes to XStudios. Uh, and it just goes to show that uh, as a small startup team, um, we're constantly working with professionals such as Han and Owen and the rest of the team to shape our product features to make sure it's accurate, it's professional, it's easy to use, and it really solve a problem. So what Stacey uh, have got on the screen now is a screenshot from Relapse Mapping. Um, so you're showing us a satellite view with a number of key overlays, uh, including I can see um, the planning. For example, mixed house versus suburban, mixed urban. We also have underground services, layer song. So basically it's quite a unique combination of map and layers to help you assess um, any property or any project that you, you might be looking at doing. I think I remember Han saying early on that uh, at X Studio, you guys take approach of an architect led or a planner led approach because there's so many different angles you have to consider underground services, infrastructure, regulatory, um, terrains, flooding, etc. So I guess Relab is quite often the, 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 your, your first step uh, of um, right. establishing whether uh, something's worthwhile doing or not. Correct, correct. And what Relab does really well is it makes this, um, this all this information, which is very, very critical, um, it makes it very, very accessible to everyone. Um, if I were to teach someone to go out um, and search for their own section um, and gather um, information from council's website and all that, that sort of stuff, um, it would be a nightmare. Um, in fact, I, I normally give up and I just check it for them. Um, but with Relab, um, it has all the critical information that you would need as a sort of developer um, all in one place. Um, the most impressive thing is actually it has the title interest on it. Um, normally, you can't even get that information without actually um, uh, requesting that information and buying it, purchasing it online um, via the council's network, and that takes around a few days to come back. Um, but you're able to assess it um, immediately on Relab. And so um, if you're doing a due diligence, which you should be um, and you should always be, um, this is the, the best process. Um, I normally tell my clients, um, when you're looking at a section, there's so much that can go wrong. And the information is very, very critical. Um, you're never going to eliminate 100% of all the problems that you're going to come across with subdivision. That is just the nature of subdivision. You have to take a little bit of risk. Otherwise, if there's no risk, everyone will be doing it. Um, yeah. But with Relab, I reckon that you could, that shaves off immediately 90% of those risks. All that information is available to you. Um, and you can be able to sort of assess for yourself without the assistance of an architect or a planner, um, if a section is viable or not. That takes you to the 95% point, in which case I normally tell my clients, then you can put in a um, offer. Um, and if that offer gets accepted, make sure you have a due diligence period of around five or 10 working days. Um, and then during the five or 10 working days, that's when you approach your architect or your planner, let them have that final assessment. 
Um, and then we take that risk elimination up to around 95%. And then the rest of the 5%, um, my clients always say they just leave it up to God um, because you can just not do anything about that. So. Cool. It's very well said. Hey, uh, I can see a question in the chat channel uh, from Daryl. Uh, and your question is how accurate is underground services, terrain provided by Relab? It is updated. Is it updated annually? Thanks. So, um, my good, good question, Daryl, if I may just quickly address that. So, Relab, the platform, we pull in data from more than 100 data points, you know, from Land Information New Zealand on titles, from South History, from Council. And our terrain is from Lens and is uh, it's updated uh, every six months. So, it's reasonably accurate with a one meter uh, being the sort of differential. And underground services, our underground services, it's in sync with Auckland Council's um, underground service. Um, you know, if you use GIS, um, that, that's where we get the info from. And uh, if I may also just touch on the hydrology, which is flooding, uh, overland flood path, flood prone, flood sensitive area. That is also live, live in sync with Auckland Council's info. Janelle, uh, I also had a question. Hi, does Relap have information on other areas in New Zealand? Uh, the answer is yes, we do have the basic information. We don't have the full uh, data set yet, but we're working very, very hard in rolling Relap out to other regions. Right now, you can check uh, up any properties in Christchurch, in Canterbury, uh, and our product is 80% is complete. For the rest of New Zealand, we're, we're working very, very hard in rolling it out. Uh, okay, so that goes, so that's our, our mapping. So here's another view, thanks Stacey, which shows us um, contour or topography, which is in the orange sort of shape. And if you zoom, if you zoom in a bit, you can actually see the, the altitude, you know, 73, 72 meters. Uh, it has got the blue, which is colored, um, flooding or hydrology overlay, which gives you flat prone, flat sensitive and overland flat path. Again, um, I guess, uh, at Relab, we do a, 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 a job that we're very proud of, which is we do a good job combining different layers of information. Otherwise, you have to go to three, four, eight different websites to get the fragmented information and manually try to make sense of, all, of them all. Uh, we know that due diligence is already very hard and very stressful, uh, stressful as is. Uh, we can buy everything here. So you can freely turn on and off a satellite map with your contour on and off with your base map on and off, and with any combination of the layers, underground services, your flooding, your um, planning, zoning, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, let's have a look at the next page. Uh, next page is uh, our subdivision calculator, which is a real high level uh, feasibility estimation that you can run with a minute uh, on Relab. So it's a, it's a premium tool uh, available to our uh, paid subscribers. And um, again, um, XStudio had a lot of IP behind this. Basically, it's a quick and easy tool for you to establish uh, whether a site uh, is feasible or not. And if so, how does your number stack up in terms of your, how many sections can you, can you in theory get out of? What's your cost input? And what does your financial um, profitability look like? Again, is this 100% accurate? Nothing is 100% accurate, but this helps you, especially with your early step um, due diligence to give you increased confidence as Han was talking about before you actually commit uh, on purchasing the land. Cool. And uh, this is our latest product. It's called Relet Planning Report. Don't worry, Han, it's, gonna, it's not going to replace our architects or our <laughs> planner friends. But basically, uh, this product came about when we were talking uh, with our a lot of our users early on. What are your pain points uh, in uh, establishing projects um, due diligence? Many of them uh, told me that they have to um, get help and advice from planners to tell them what are the planning rules around any particular property. Um, why wouldn't they go to Open Council website? Because it's so hard to find if you're not a professional planner. Uh, but planners are busy uh, and so, so are architects. So we have developed this tool. It's a fully automated tool. You can use it online. It's another premium tool where it allows you to run a early stage planning feasibility report. It tells you everything. Uh, I think Stacy showed us a, state, a table of contents, your maps, your zoning maps, your zoning standards, activities table, 
uh, this is the zoning standard. It has information such as height restriction, coverage, height to uh, in relation boundary ratio. These are all the key considerations uh, that a, a planner or, architect or an architect need to apply. Uh, at, you know when they're designing an, an outcome. So we uh, we don't have any judgment. Um, we simply present the, the data set uh, for you. And if you want, you can actually click on any of the links on the right hand side. It says source and we'll push you to the council website. You can you can read up on any one of those rules. So basically, we make information transparent and accessible uh, for our users. Um, I will just check if there's any questions for Han. Um, there was one under the new medium density proposal. If you want to simplify, you need resources. So not much difference there, right? Um, we did um, have a webinar when we were talking about the medium density proposal, and um, Foss from Rico did say that yeah the amount of um, resource consents that are completely taken away isn't huge, but it does affect um, the process a bit for a lot of um, consent. So Han, do you have anything to say about that? Was this the question, sorry, you cut off a little bit there, um, with, with the requirement with the resource consent? Yeah, so you, um, uh, yeah, you'll still need it. Yeah, um, yeah the, the article that um, the Herald published was a little bit of a clickbait, as usual. Um, the thing with a, a streamlined, no resource consent um, pathway, you have to comply, I believe, um, best to check with the plan to final, um, but um, I believe you must have to comply with all of the standards of the new medium density proposal. Um, if you're doing a subdivision, you're not complying with all those standards because you're still going to have some sort of infringement on um, at least one or two of those standards. If you're not doing that, you're not maximizing your site. Um, so for example, if you have a 600 um, or 700 square meter section, um, you're not going to choose most cases um, the four unit um, option um, for subdivision because it doesn't give you the, the highest yield. Um, most sites would look to push for five or six units on a 600 square meter section. Um, and if they do, they're going to infringe on one of the new medium density proposals. And so you're still going to have to do a resource consent regardless. Um, it does apply on a very, very number of small cases where say you have a 600 or 700 square meter site, but it's in a very, very good area, um, such as the Milford area, um, where the demand for high density isn't there, but the demand for luxury um, sort of um, uh, houses um, is. And so maybe um, if you go down that avenue and you say, I want four houses, um, they're not going to be maximized. Um, I'm not going to infringe on height to boundary. I'm going to have a compliant lawn because I want my, my buyer to, um, to buy into a very, very um, uh, well um, finished product. Um, that has a really, really um, high standard of living, um, then that might be a particular case where you don't need resource consent. But I would say that would only make up around 10 to 20 percent of all the resource consents moving forward next year. That's just my ballpark figure. Cool. And Ethan has a question. Are contacts for architects for bulk location studies included in Relab services? Are there any plans to automate the BNL 3D model studies in the future? Knight, do you want to take this one? Hi, um, hi Ethan. Um, so right now it's not included in Relab service. And the reason for that is if you've got Relab and, and the value we provide is still uh, the consolidation of different pieces of information from early on and also the different type and the diversity of the information such as the maps the legal side of things and the different tools which none other software and systems can provide so that's going to be our continuous strategy but in terms of you know if you're talking about um, bulk and location 3d modeling i believe you are a bit further down the path of early stage due diligence and if that is the case uh, my advice is definitely kind of involve the architect, the engineer, the planner, the surveyor, et cetera, 
uh, the pr professional service providers who will be able to do that. I mean, in theory, we could provide 3D models studies in future, but in terms of the level of, um, I guess, um, uh, just the level of details and the, the, the knowledge and experience involved is simply a software that has its limitations. So, um, yeah, so it's, long and short answer is, uh, yes, we are definitely looking into 3D map presentation of our data, uh, but in terms of providing bulk and location, um, it, it's very much, again, an expert job and we advise our users to um, go and consult with a, um, yeah. Awesome. Cool. Um, cool. If there's no more questions, we'll wrap up there. Um, thank you for everyone for watching and um, a huge thank you for Han for joining us today. Um, this is the last web web webinar we're hosting. <laughs> um, so, if, um, where was I even talking? This is the web <laughs> last webinar of the year. It's the last webinar of the year, so we hope you have a nice break over the holidays and we hope you've enjoyed our webinars um, so far. We've got some really exciting ones coming up in January, so do keep an eye out on our Facebook and LinkedIn pages there because uh, they'll be really cool. Um, and if you haven't done a free trial on Relab yet, um, head over to our website to start a free trial. Um, it might be a nice time to start a trial because you can have some time to actually really dig deep and look at what we offer. Um, so yeah, cool. Thank you so much, everyone. Lou's put those links in the chat so you can get right there. Cool. Um, thanks, Knight. Thanks, Mom. Cool. Thank you. Thank Have a good you. and safe Christmas. Yeah. Cheers, guys. Bye. See ya.